relevant to this very specific situation the current situation uh, there are uh, 151 patients diagnosed and uh, unfortunately there are four deaths reported in sri lanka and currently uh, 127 patients are obtaining getting treatment so there may be a lot of issues that we need to discuss and clarify so today also we have a lot of experts join with us and uh, we have dr bjc pereira the consultant pediatrician and then Dr. Padma Gunaratna, the president of the uh, Geriatrics Physicians uh, Association uh, of Sri Lanka. And do, we have Dr. Rohan Ruanpura, the forensic pathologist. And we expect uh, Dr. Deepa Gamage also to join with us related to the epidemiology aspect. And we have Professor Manuj Virasing as well. And uh, there are many others, other senior clinicians who have joined with us during the discussion. So let's start the discussion. and. Uh, Maybe we can start with uh, Dr. BJC Pereira. Sir, are you online? Pramod? Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, okay. So, I'm, I'm here. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we have a lot of questions to ask from you because so far we haven't discussed about the specific aspects related to children, uh, management of children. As far as we are aware now, the College of Pediatricians has come out with a set of guidelines. Uh, which is in the approval process. Would you like to say a few words about the guidelines that is being developed and the current situation and also anything uh, specific that you want to mention about management of children? Uh, uh, thank you, Indika. Can you all hear me? We can hear you, sir. We can hear you clearly. Okay. Um, thank you very much for asking me to join this webinar. Uh, yes, we have just produced our guidelines. It's about a couple of days now when it was completed and circulated. Um, it is by the College of Pediatricians. And as far as I can say that this is uh, probably the only pediatric guideline uh, that uh, is around uh, virtually in the world um, that uh, all the other uh, institutions have got uh, Kind of guide uh, guidance, but no real uh, guideline for it. Uh, and the um, formal guidelines in that we have produced in the uh, College of Pediatricians have taken into account uh, the all the available information up to the present time. Uh, but uh, one thing must be stressed that uh, there is a dearth of uh, pediatric data right from the start of this um, pandemic uh, because um, there are mostly uh, what is available are just one or two case um, sort of large relatively large uh, case series and the others are single case reports so there is a lack of data, but we have gone on what is available uh, to us. And uh, it is now uh, being circulated to all the members and the council of the Sri Lanka College of Pediatricians. And within uh, a very short time, I think it will come out in our website of the Sri Lanka College of Pediatricians. And that is open access, anyone can access it. Um, so it will be in the public domain uh, within the next couple of days. Uh, thank you, sir. Now, uh, related to the, the diagnosis of patients, now uh, in the guidelines you have the case definition. So is it very much similar to the case de definition that is followed by the Ministry of Health and the College of Physicians, or are there any differences? And uh, We have uh, based our case definitions uh, mainly on the guidelines issued by the Ministry of Health but uh, with one slight difference. We have stressed that um, fever does not seem to be, at least in the pediatric setup, does not seem to be a, a, a kind of a mandatory criterion because when you look at some of the literature that is available to us, that almost up to or very close to 50% of all patients, who had, uh, all pediatric patients who have uh, been tested positive for uh, COVID-19, um, they have not had any fever. A uh, few of them have developed fever 
after being admitted and after being diagnosed, but at the time of diagnosis, virtually 50% have not had uh, fever. So I think this is an important criteria uh, because people may be sort of thrown into a false sense of security if uh, the child does not have fever. But I think this is a limitation that we must stress uh, as far as uh, case definitions are concerned. The other thing is we have defined our uh, cases that have been diagnosed according to severity. So starting with the asymptomatic patient, now these are very important group in children, um, which has come more and more into prominence in the recent past, uh, because uh, these asymptomatic patients can also transmit the disease. They are carriers who keep on um, shedding the virus. And especially in the first week after the virus actually gets a hold on them, although there are no symptoms, there is a very fair chance of them um, uh, disseminating the virus. So this is a very important group. But apart from that, the rest are uh, dependent on the clinical severity like mild, severe and critical, uh, fairly similar to most of the classifications uh, that are around, I think even for the adult. Yeah. So, uh, so in that case, your suggestion is uh, to have a high degree of suspicion when it comes to children. Uh, very much so, Indika, because I think um, um, we have to go on the uh, experience and the findings of the pediatricians and the junior staff who look after the children, uh, because as you quite correctly say that there should be a very, very high degree of suspicion. Now, this becomes even more important now uh, because uh, people are now finding that a lot of our patients and a lot of the parents do not seem to understand the reality of the situation. And many of them do not give the important contact history because we are so far basing a lot of our detection processes on the contact history. Now, people, I think, are beginning to sort of um, withhold or hide the contact history. So there it becomes even more important, uh, especially for testing purposes, that uh, the opinion of the attending consultant pediatrician becomes the one single uh, kind of um, criterion on which these things should be based on. I don't think the necessity to test children, uh, the, the, can be the decision can be taken by anyone. I repeat anyone other than the consult pediat consultant pediatrician in charge of the case. Uh, so related to that, uh, the testing aspect, how are the samples taken? Is it different from the adult practice, uh, the sites that are taken? Um, they are more or less the same, actually. I think we are still going on with the uh, nasopharyngeal uh, samples and uh, the um, oropharyngeal samples. Um, that is really the, uh, the things that are practiced for adults as well. Uh, but we have also um, indicated that the same swab uh, may be used uh, for, to collect sample from both the oropharynx as well as an aspharynx. And uh, real complete details of exactly how to get this done as is given in our guidelines so with very, very specific details. Uh, at the moment, although there is some evidence in some quarters in the, uh, around the world that saliva can be used for obvious reasons as far as children are concerned, we are not using saliva at the present time. Uh, the second thing is that um, uh, people have also asked me uh, why uh, we are not uh, advocating um, uh, sputum. Uh, now, getting sputum from children is not the easiest of things, uh, so that there are technical problems. And also, by inducing a child to cough, the uh, chances of dissemination of the virus also become that much higher. Uh, 
And the other important thing that we have stressed in the guidelines is that any healthcare worker who's going to collect these samples from children should be in complete personal protection, protective equipment. This is essential uh, because even if there is the slightest suspicion that the child may be having uh, this coronavirus infection, that I think we have to be really, really careful. So all healthcare personnel who have to collect these and exact details are given in our guidelines. Uh, they have to be extremely careful and should be having a full set of personal protective equipment. Yes. Uh, when it comes to the management of these children, how, where are they managed? Are they, when they are about COVID suspect, where are they managed? And when they are confirmed, uh, is there a separate setting for the management? Um, there are many hospitals that uh, would take in suspected cases, but when they are confirmed, uh, they are generally uh, sent to the infectious diseases hospital. And from there, the rest of the course will depend on the severity of the disease. Uh, and uh, well, as most people are aware, quite a large majority of these children have got relatively mild disease. But that is not to say that they cannot develop severe disease, like pneumonia and very severe pneumonia. Uh, there are cases that have developed all this, but uh, they are very few. And if the child is developing more significant and severe complications, that uh, it depends on the state. If they need intensive care, uh, very often they would be sent to the uh, later region hospital intensive care unit at the moment. But I think the authorities are now exploring the possibilities of having a completely well-equipped separate um, institutions for treating children with uh, this COVID-19 uh, infection. So, uh, thank you for that very important information. So, any specific me message that you want to go and uh, give uh, before we move to Dr. Padma Um Yes, I think one thing is that I think just as even the Secretary General of uh, World Health Organization has said, I think testing becomes very, very important. And in children especially, especially because that I said uh, earlier about asymptomatic infection and also the possibility of the parents not giving us all the details about possible contacts, that it becomes even more important. And I stress again that the decision, whether there is a necessity to test these uh, children who are suspected uh, would entirely depend on the um, on the uh, attending consultant pediatric. I think that onus has to be borne by him or her. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, and uh, if our participants have specific questions uh, to be asked from Dr. BJC. Ferreira, who is a very senior pediatrician and a past president of SLMA. You are most welcome to send your questions so that we can direct to him. Uh, thank you, sir. And uh, then we'll be moving. Thank through you very Dr. much. I'll be around. Dr. Padma Gunaratna, uh, who is the president elect of SLMA. And uh, her special interest area is about the elderly the population because they're at high risk. Uh, Madam, can you tell a bit more about uh, what is the current um, uh, situation, what is the role of protecting elders in this situation and, and why and how can we do it? Um, in the care, when we discuss on this COVID-19, it has become very important that we uh, pay attention towards safeguarding the elders uh, in our uh, community. The reason is that uh, when the outbreak developed in Wuhan, China, when the case series uh, built up to about 70,000, the analysis, pub the, the age-specific analysis published that, I mean, uh, we all know that this is a very uh, uh, high risk, uh, highly virulent organism that could affect any age. But if you take the uh, complications, 
the uh, elders, I mean, say, uh, elders carry a higher risk of developing complications out of elders. About 30 to 60 percent of elders, about 60, develop complications. And uh, out of them, about 11 to 30 uh, percent of people more than 65 years, 11 to 30 percent would need intensive care unit. And then out of them, about uh, 4 to 11 percent would succumb to illness. So the, if you take the age-specific uh, uh, data that has been, uh, that is available in Worldometer, uh, the, for people above 85 years of age, the risk of, the, or the probability of dying uh, of this illness is about 20, 15 to 20%. And for people between 70 to 79 years, it's about 8%. And for 60 to 69 years, it's about uh, 3.8 percent when uh, the death rate in people less than 50 years of age is 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 percent. So the, the basic understanding that has to be there with us is that, I mean, it's the elder that who is more likely to develop complications, who is likely to seek the hospital uh, treatment, and then who is more likely to uh, burden the intensive care units and then once they ask, and I mean, once we put them into intensive care unit, it's likely that they would block that bed or the ICU for about uh, another seven, 10 days. And that would be a huge burden in, in addition to that the elders have the poor outcome. It would be a huge burden for health system and that would deprive the uh, needed attention for other healthcare professionals as well as the uh, people at a younger age, the, the true that there are young, I mean, who develop severe illness, but if we get a sort of a surge of elders, then that would really, uh, I mean, there's a possibility that might affect the, uh, our, the, the uh, capacity of the uh, healthcare system to a, a great extent. So in, in that context, it becomes very important that we, uh, give very specific advice, uh, very specific attention towards elders, uh, particularly with regard to prevention of the illness. So uh, there are, when we discuss on prevention, there are uh, two uh, sets of uh, preventive measures. I mean, before that, I need to say that according to uh, a Center for Disease Control data in the United States, out of every 10 deaths, eight had been more than uh, people more than 65 years of age. So even there, they highlight the need to uh, sort of uh, uh, to prevent the illness among elders. So the, uh, there are two people that we need to pay attention. Those are, I mean, uh, particular, in particular, the elders and then the caregivers. So those are the two categories that uh, uh, we need to pay attention. So for elders, we specifically say that the, for them, to stay at home. I mean, there's no reason why they should come out of home at this point of time. And then to sort of, uh, as much as possible to self-isolate, avoid meeting visitors, and then to maintain the uh, uh, social distancing. And in addition to that, the usual very specific advice that is available for all, uh, uh, with regard to hand washing, to wash a uh, hand with soap and water, uh, and also the methods of sneezing, coughing. And in particular for elderly, we advise on the need for them to have a, a healthy balanced diet and to have regular exercise and to keep them occupied because they are very much, because uh, of this outbreak, they are very much emotionally involved and particularly to keep them isolated, that itself would be very stressful for them. So for them to keep them occupied, maybe with uh, reading or by uh, uh, using the electronic by electronic means to be in touch with the rest of the world. So, uh, and in addition to that, uh, it's important that we discuss with regard to comorbidities. I mean, the, while the comorbidities are more common among elders, Anyway, the people with comorbidities are with a higher risk of developing complications in relation to COVID-19. Uh, we know that with aging, 
our immunity anyway is uh, 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 disturbed and uh, the immunity goes down so that the people with diabetes, people uh, or the patients who have had organ transplants, the people, patients who are on treatment for asthma and rheumatoid arthritis, uh, patients who are on cancer treatment, they all are immunocompromised. And in addition to that, the patients who are with chronic respiratory disease, smoking and alcoholism are also with a higher risk to develop complications. So uh, there has to be particular attention, specifically, uh, I mean, for these people as well, the patients who are, are with multiple comorbidities because they carry a higher risk. So if we consider even in our context, out of four patients that who uh, had passed away, we say that three of them are more than 60 years of age, and it's only one person who is less than 58 years of age. And three of them are with multiple comorbidities. So I think it's extremely important that we communicate to public two messages. One is for prevention with regard to, I mean, with regard to prevention of disease among elders, as well as the specific advice for children or the caregivers. Yeah, so your basic message is to shield our elders as much, as much as possible. Yes, very correct. Yeah, and if we ask a specific question, say many of our doctors or many of our SLMA members, they may be having their parents at home. So anything, any specific precaution that they should be taking? Uh, if I were asked by a healthcare professional at this point of time who is actively involved with clinical practice and or who carries the risk of getting exposed to patients, I would have said that, that if you have a sibling please keep your relatives with that seed. That, that's your answer. I mean, better to take... I, I, I think, I mean, to, this, is, this yeah. is the time that yeah. uh, uh, I think I, I would be happy to keep them in a different okay. place because... Yeah. Uh, yeah, because I think uh, most of our doctors would like to find out exactly because uh, parents are so precious. Yeah. And another question, Madam, now this elderly population, as you have mentioned, they have other comorbidities. And then during this time period, especially when they are in this very strict isolation, they may be having problems related to getting other drugs like the drugs for the NCDs and the drugs that they are taking. So what should be the solution for that? The, um, uh, the, it, it's extremely important that they uh, continue with their usual drugs uh, even during this period. Now, if you uh, consider hospital setting, in our hospital clinic patients, I mean, you generally do not come across acute emergencies in clinic setting. So all these patients who attend to clinic, we provide them drug treatment for one month, not because that we need to see them every month. That's, that's because that the, it had been the sort of basic rule uh, uh, that had been in the uh, Ministry of Health throughout for many logistical reasons. I mean, uh, they, because that uh, if we give supply for two months, then the hospital has to maintain a bigger stock for patients and so on. So for many of these patients, if we see them once in two months, that is good enough. So I think that at this point of time, we have to look into a possible ways of I mean, replenish their drugs too. So I think government has come up with varying ways and means of providing them with drugs. I mean, true that there are little shortcomings, but then I think that uh, at the, uh, uh, as it has become extremely important that we take care of uh, these patients and to keep away from the crowded places, I think that this would be the best place to provide them with drugs while they are at home. Uh, even in the private sector, uh, for many of the patients who come regularly, generally they are given prescription for two, three months. And, uh, uh, and uh, the facilities have been made available in many places for them to directly contact us via the hospital or if otherwise, I think at this point of time, many of them, they take, I mean, while they visit the uh, private uh, consultants, they, some, a good number of patients, they, uh, they uh, get the are still attached to hospital clinics for supply of their usual drugs, as well as that more often the, uh, they are with family, uh, they are general practitioners, as well as the pharmacies are also a little lenient uh, with regard to providing their uh, uh, 
uh, continuous supply of drugs. So basically, uh, they need to look, there are many ways that they could look into. And uh, I actually feel that this is the best time for us to rethink and even for SLMA to strengthen the primary health care system for us to have our own GP and to be uh, 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 attached to the closest hospital uh, and to get back to our basic principles of medicine and to strengthen those uh, so that it would take us long way forward. I think uh, from SLMA's point of view, we fully agree with you to have a localized system uh, with the GP and maybe Gramani Ladari and the PH, PHM and the medical officer MOH all coming together to have a system to make sure that uh, this regular supply of medicines is continued. So we need to have those mechanisms. Hopefully they are slowly evolving. And uh, since this is not something that any of us have faced previously, hopefully the systems will evolve. Yeah. Yes. Uh, any, any, any other key message that you want to give before we reach this uh, part of the interview? The, uh, any other key message is uh, where, with regard to uh, drug treatment, they have to uh, continue drugs and then it's important that they understand that all his hospitals are still open for emergencies. Yes. So there shouldn't be any undue anxiety among elders because uh, all the hospitals are open and, uh, and irrespective of whether it is government or private, uh, all the emergencies are uh, being managed by the medical profession. So I think that if there are any, uh, any elder that, uh, uh, who is with any serious uh, uh, or any uh, anxiety or, uh, uh, or any other serious ailment, uh, they should seek the closest bigger hospital for their ailment. Yeah. yeah. In, in relation to that, this is a general question, uh, maybe from uh, Dr. BJC as well. What about keeping the major hospitals COVID free and having separate triage system and for the suspect patient, a separate hospital system and for the diagnosed confirmed patients, another separate hospital system, identified system, because it's already happened in, in the Ministry of Health, that line of thinking. And then the major hospitals can return to the, the routine functions because they too cannot be ignored. What do you think about that kind of suggestion? Can I say something? Yes, uh, yes, 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 I think yes. this is something that we have brought to the notice of authorities uh, because it's extremely important as far as children go. Now, one particular and very good example is the Lady Ridgeway Hospital. Now, there are uh, thousands of patients who turn up there, both in the outpatient department and the inward uh, patients uh, who have many, many other diseases. There are loads of children there who are being followed up long term for esoteric disease. So, there are a whole load of other patients who are there and who are really particularly vulnerable to catch um, this uh, coronavirus infection uh, from other uh, patients who have the disease. Now, two things that have been shown are that children uh, in two groups are very, very vulnerable. Uh, and also even more importantly, they are quite vulnerable to develop more serious disease. One group are the patients who have chronic respiratory disorders. Now, even asthmatics have been shown to be more vulnerable to develop the disease as well as develop more serious disease. And the second group are those who have immunocompromisation. Yes. Now, these may be due to inherited disorders of immunity or even uh, disordered immunity as a result of treatment. For instance, say the renal transplants. Uh, or other forms of transplant, those who have had um, bone marrow transplant, uh, those who have had problems with spleen, the splenia and things like that. So these are two groups and some of these children, quite a lot of these children, are actually managed in the Lady Ridgeway Hospital. Yeah. So I, I totally agree with what you say that I think under ideal circumstances, I don't think that a hospital like the Lady Ridgeway Hospital would be the best place uh, to look after even complicated uh, um, yes. patients who have 
complicated disease with this coronavirus infection. So yeah. we really have to find another place. And there have been suggestions where um, they have indicated whether we could use the uh, um, Neville Fernando Hospital uh, for this purpose. I think these are all things that are being worked out by the uh, Ministry of Health. I think in all fairness, they are very receptive to what uh, yes. we have had to say about this. Uh, but of course, the circumstances are such that uh, to get all these equipment, to have the expertise available in these, now that will have to be looked at as well. Yeah. Very Victor, can I just, yes, uh, yes. Add, yes. Yeah. just add, because uh, two days back, uh, there was a technical meeting in the ministry, which I participated in, Indigo was also there. There we were given a task of uh, get, giving a proposal to identify where or the hospitals or institutions where we could uh, run the essential services and where could be or where should we uh, locate the patients uh, who are affected by the COVID. So we have gone through the whole list of hospitals thoroughly in the country and yesterday afternoon we submitted uh, our proposal what hospitals to be spared for normal functions to be uh, carried out and what hospitals could be taken purely as COVID hospitals, so the hospitals to cater COVID, because for two reasons. First one is, when we are having a hospital for dual purpose, there are two issues coming. First one is patients who have normal issues, not normal means not COVID issues, may be reluctant to attend. And then the parents, for as uh, Dr. B. J. C. Vera said, the parents may not be willing to take their children to a hospital where the COVID patients are being housed. Secondly, when we are looking at the HR situation in the hospitals, there is adequate space for contamination or exposure to the health staff who are looking after both sides. For example, there are quarters where the MOs, nurses, and other elder, orderlies are working. And there will be common canteens, common areas. So people who are working and treating and looking after COVID patients would be passing through those, which can have issues of uh, contamination. And maybe we may have to fully give a quarantine hospital or a ward or whatever if the, we run on this dual setup. Considering that we have given a plan for the ministry, actually yesterday I sent the plan, identify all hospitals that could be purely taken to COVID on a staggered basis. Not at the beginning we are going to release them, but depending on the caseload, depending on the issues that we see in these different districts, they could uh, revert to a plan where they have a master plan of releasing hospitals purely for COVID, but other hospitals definitely should continue their normal service. Now, the issue is normal services are somewhat disrupted. We don't have clinics, even if there is no curfew for certain areas. So that is disrupting the essential services. And this could lead to a huge problem of people are not coming till late to the hospital. Yes. Uh, Manoj, so from... Uh Taking on from there, I think uh, planning is very important when it comes to this kind of situation. And it's not only to plan for the current situation, but to plan for the future as well. Can you explain, as a health system expert, can you explain what's the current situation and what are the projections for the future? And how can the health system be prepared for this situation? First thing is, uh, we have done a projection. We have done a projection almost one week back uh, for the Sri Lankan, uh, looking at Sri Lankan data. And we have updated the projections uh, uh, for, from uh, two days back. And uh, the projection is, has been given to the Ministry of Health. And tomorrow, actually, we have asked again to present. We presented it twice. Again, we have asked to present to the whole of the ministry and the rest of our colleges and the SLM and others. So that is there. 
so what we can see is looking at the global level looking at the sri lankan situation looking at the stringent efforts we are going to have and the possibility of relaxing some of those stringent efforts in the future this epidemic is not to be looked at one week two week or three weeks so we have to live covid for at least six months in this country probably more than that that is the general consensus and that is the consensus across the globe therefore the planning for in the health and rest of the country should look for at least 9 months from now and plan our work in the health system that is what i emphasized earlier we cannot restrict hospitals only for emergency work as we are doing now because there are patients there are naturally occurring issues so we have to cater to day to day needs of our patients and we cannot actually uh, postpone certain surgeries and so on and there is a limit of postponing even routine surgeries so we i think very clearly we need to give that message across that we need to start essential functions in the health system that is why we have proposed separate hospitals to these rather than having a dual system that is one second one planning for each other i think i need to tell it here because i express my views a couple of days back and that was the general view of all who were there in the technical committee we are looking at 500 600 beds ventilators and icus but very few thing when we have 500 beds utilized for covid in icus we need to have at least about 13000 patients of covid and you need to understand we have only 82000 beds in our whole state sector hospitals so when we have utilized about 13000 beds that is the point that we will need about 5000 beds in icus so all of you i the health system for so many years we know how would be when we have something like that so the planning is here at the moment from the ministry point of view and from the epidemiological units point of view and from our point of view is to prevent prevent and prevent something like that happening therefore we have to emphasize in our planning to make sure there is no community spread going on we have to limit this to the cluster and extended clusters if we lose it and if we go beyond from my understanding about 800 900 patients in the community the health system itself will have problems because there can be disintegration in the system looking at the hr looking at the resources we have looking at the supply chains to maintain health in this country we will not be able to actually sustain therefore i think our priority is here still at the moment should be on prevention yes as you said sir mentioned about the testing now there is uh, the epid unit has taken a plan of testing of extended contacts and they will also go through more to extend it to certain community contacts and so on so that plan is on i think they are already started it that is how about uh, 10 people from putlam of the extended contact contact who did not have signs were detected yesterday i think the jafna they did about 10 as far as i know and the training is across the country now they are doing it uh, in a systematic way so i think that is been done but it does not mean indiscriminate testing and indiscriminate loop, uh, testing and uh, just st- stating people that you do not have corona the issue is if we are going for huge testing at the moment when we do not have evidence of active community spread we give a false assurance to people 
that you are safe. So we have to be extremely careful about that. That is one. Second one, the epidemiology unit, the ground staff, and the military is doing a wonderful job of containing this epidemic. If we do unnecessarily uh, relax testing uh, testing I do criteria, then people who are in quarantine could turn back and say, I will get a test done somewhere and they will show something and say I'm negative. But it does not mean he is actually safe. He can get positive some uh, later because most of these rapid tests that we have are antibodies. So it will come positive late. And there will be a whole set of false negatives coming in because uh, there are issues because nobody has still clearly stated these rapid tests are good. So I think the planning up to now from the ministry, from the meetings that I attended is to go for PCR and make sure if you are getting a person for PCR, you quarantine, test it, and then two tests will be done. And before they are discharged, if they are positive, Again, two tests will be done. So there is a protocol. So what I feel as an Indica asked, we need to look at the current best practices and adhere to those. And we should not uh, propagate practices that are not given, ratified by the health authorities, which is the epidemiologic at the moment. I think that is the basis that I want to uh, contribute but on beyond that I will have to tell two things as we are looking for at least six months plus period I'm not telling six months curfew but six months plus period of changing our way of delivery of services changing of postgraduate learning for our doctors we need to go to different methods of learning teaching for postgraduates without getting them to classrooms. And on the other hand, we have to look at schools and other places also, although it is beyond our control, to go through a more or new methods of learning, teaching. Otherwise, there will be social issues, social unrest. That would have a very bad effect on the whole control program. So I think uh, these are the general areas that I would want to talk about planning. There are in depth interview uh, discussions going on how to do it we will come and tell what's happening in future uh, discussions okay there are some uh, questions coming in uh, one question is about testing whether are we now we are using pcr for diagnostics so community also are we using the same or is there a new test kit that is being used that is one mm -hmm. question that has come in yes this was actually discussed a couple, uh, yesterday and uh, the day before. Still, what is coming from the PID unit and uh, the general agreement in the ministry is to use PCR. And even for those extended contacts that has been going on, the PCR is used because then uh, that have less issues than having a uh, having a rapid test where nobody has still clearly stated or ratified using rapid test. So even if uh, we are going to do community sampling, to look at community surveillance, to look at sentinel surveillance, up to now, I think the protocols and decisions are to use PCR. So, yeah, so thank you. So that, that, that has been the stance of the Ministry of Health and the Epidemiology Unit as well. There's a response from Dr. Ushani confirming the same, that uh, PCR is for diagnosis and antibody test does not have any value of diagnosis and is to confirm that someone had the disease and for maybe uh, monitoring and evaluation purposes. So it's confirmed the same and uh, I think the Ministry's stance at the moment remains the same. Okay. Uh, Manoj, now you said that we might have to live with this for several months and yeah. within those months now, how long would you think that we have to uh, apply these very stringent measures uh, like what you're having at the moment, uh, considering like a reasonable adherence to the advisors would be there because they yes. never, yeah. Yes, uh, my answer will not be a popular answer. 
looking at the epidemiological patterns we are we are analyzed uh, at least uh, the five countries uh, using our model and uh, to look at predictions to sri lanka if you look at china if you look at uh, south korea those are the two countries who have actually had control this if you look at that it's very clear very severe very stringent measures of social distancing has been applied for at least two incubation periods before they could see a change in the epidemic curve so that very clear from the which means 30 days of stringent measures before we can see at least the change of the direction of the epidemic curve in those two countries which means two incubation periods has to be there with very strict uh, control at least to see change of direction of the epidemic that does not mean we can uh, be uh, we can relax it just after two incubation periods from what we understand from the epidemic predictions what we can see is it will we will need at least a minimum of four four incubation periods to settle our case load with the re, uh, basic reproduction number what we are telling is adding new cases basic reproduction number to come below 1 it will be at least about four incubation periods that we need to apply these stringent measures i know there are serious issues of the for the general day to day lives of people there will be issues of uh, for the other patients and so on but we need to look at if we relax what will happen versus if we do not relax and go through these four incubation periods and settle this issue and stop transmission within the country so i think we have to look at the trade offs and decide so basically we are referring to kind of a hammer and dance method initially you hit hard that try to control it with stringent measures and then you basically uh, gradually relax but still the control is maintained am i correct yeah, that yeah yeah very clearly there are at least two uh, papers who have gone very deep into chinese wuhan experiment i would say is a wuhan experiment they very clearly say early closure of schools workplace and others to make social distance a reality and delayed and staggered opening of those to make sure that the spread will not suddenly have a support from social or removal of social distancing which means we definitely have to so my understanding we have to close schools and possibly non essential workplaces till up to for my understanding the second week of may at least second week of may to stop the spread within those small clusters if we start having cluster epidemics again then the issue is all things that we have done for about one month or one and a half months will be in vain yeah so that that means i mean a serious kind of consideration and stringent measures but judging by what's happening in other countries probably probably we don't have any other option the only way to go is to control it not to control but basically to suppress and then maintain control there are that is exactly questions. that is yeah. exactly the countries who have got out of it has done yes. countries who was, who took delayed measures they have still not been able to change their direction of the epidemic curve so and we you so we see now there were 52000 deaths one and one 1 million about 32000 cases it may be underestimated deaths are almost real but the cases may be underestimated particularly looking at india and other countries so we need to judge it and face it with the maximum precautions and not looking only at ease of human life okay uh, yeah getting back to the testing there are a lot of questions coming 
related to uh, testing. I think Dr. Shirani is there. Uh, Pramod, can you unmute her? Uh, that's yeah. one question. Yes, that's one question. Are they having enough PCR test kits in the country? And uh, what is the quality confirmation related to that? I mean, do we have enough test kits? Dr. Shirani, are you on? Can I just answer, uh, just give one uh, idea because in the technical committee from the ministry side who is who is actually dealing with this business very clearly stated for the moment they have enough PCR kits. Dr. Shirani, are you, we can see you online. Okay, till she comes, uh, there's another question related to immunity. Uh, maybe Dr. BJC Pereira, if you can answer, sir. It's about the B BCG immunization. Is there a relationship between the immunity or the protection to COVID and the BCG immunization? Are there any evidence? Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, there is uh, some information. Uh, but um, I think um, what we have to keep in mind is that uh, there is no hard and fast evidence. All we have are the uh, implications of what people have found as far as data are concerned. I think this question of BCG uh, came up uh, very early uh, because there are uh, certain countries where BCG is mandated. Whereas in others, it is not given at all. So some of the earlier work was based on comparing the at least two of the countries uh, where it was mandatory and uh, the other countries where it was not mandatory. And what they did was that they compared the what was going on in Italy against what was going on in Japan. Now, in Japan, it is mandatory. In Italy, it is not. So they looked at uh, basically a very, very broad and virtually a crude um, outcome of this entire problem. What they found was that in Italy, where BCG vaccination was not mandatory, that the death rate uh, was sort of assessed as something like 16 per million population. And um, in Japan, it was less than one, where it was mandatory to have the BCG vaccination. It was less than one. In fact, the real figure was 0 0.78 per million. So this is where they started to think that perhaps BCG has some effect. Now, we know that BCG has a certain quite significant effect on the immunity. And now what has happened is because of these uh, speculations and postulations, they have started several trials in different countries. Uh, and one particularly important one is in Australia, in Melbourne, where they are going to recruit 4,000 healthcare workers. And I think they will have them divided into two groups of one with treatment and the other as a control group. Um, and the, they are going to compare uh, what is going to happen to or what the future would be for these people. The earliest um, uh, comparative study of, uh, in recent times was done, in, I think, in the Netherlands, where they compared uh, 200 uh, pace, uh, people who, to whom BCT was given against 200 people who were the control group. And they found that the 200 people who had the BCG uh, contracted uh, the disease, um, uh, lower numbers contracted the disease. But these are all rather small studies. Actually. You need very large studies. I think we have to await the results of the Melbourne study. But of course, the, these results are not going to come out very quickly. Uh, because I think it will take at least a minimum of two months before we have definite answers. So, uh, and then uh, we have Dr. Shirani also, uh, if she can answer to the question on the PCR kits. 
Uh, do we have enough numbers here? Uh, actually, we are having shortages. Indika? Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Can, we can hear you. Uh, actually, we don't have good quality PCR kits as much as we would like to have. At the moment, we are continuing with the new centers opening up like ADH and Ratnapura for PCR testing. So one problem we have is to have viral transport medium and subs for collection of samples. This is a problem. We might have to change the criteria to collect sputum as a sample, but patients with dry cough, we have to try to find some other way, like using SOBS. Uh, as for PCR, if we concentrate in main centers, we can have maximum number of capacity building because then we don't have to waste controls. Because one run, we need four controls. We have to think about those things, but we are trying our best to uh, procure necessary kits for this testing. We can't forget that there's a world shortage. Yeah. At the same time, I mean, uh, you are also suggesting that uh, uh, there is, we can test more and need to test more. Is that your suggestion? Yes, I mean, if we can test, we, we should test contacts and uh, patients. Yeah. So I, I suppose this uh, issue of the, the transport media, this was brought up during the technical committee, also brought up by UN ministries. Yes attending to that, but other than that, the test, other aspects, uh, there are no shortages. Am I correct there? Uh, what do you mean by other aspects? I mean, I was, the the, the transport a... medium, there seem to be an issue. Uh, yes. Yeah. Is that the only shortage that you are having at the moment? Test kits also, we have a problem, the quality ones, uh -huh. with high predictive value. Okay, I so, think we oh, got one, uh, two as consignments. Yeah. With that, we are running. Should, no, the, should be. Okay. Yeah. So I, th I think ministries attended, they are very much aware uh, and they are attending to yes. this issue at the moment. And yes, they, they want are to, doing their best. Yeah, they are, they are doing their best, I think, to, to their credit because uh, they want to increase the testing capacity up to 1,500. At the moment, there are about 200 tests are being done, isn't it? Uh, more than that. Yesterday, even MRI did more than 150. More than 150, yeah. All so, over the country, it must have been more if they have collected samples. Collected samples, yeah. It depends so on the, the number of samples they receive. Okay, yeah. yeah. So the ministry's plan is to uh, expand the capacity to at least about 1,500. So so they, they are doing everything that they can do uh, to increase that capacity. Yes. Mm, then uh, we'll move into uh, another area. Uh, now is Dr. Ruanpura here? Dr. Wanpura? Hamod, can you unmute? Dr. Wanpura? Yes, unmuted. Great, yeah. Dr. Wanpura, can you hear us? Yes, okay. Yeah. Uh, now, Dr. Wanpura, the, uh, the, the unfortunate but the inevitable situation where the COVID deaths come in, it has happened at the moment. There are four patients. So, uh, what is your input regarding, say, if someone has uh, suspect, COVID suspect patient has passed away. So what, what are the measures that has to be taken in the hospital? And if a COVID diagnosed patient has passed away, then what are the measures? Can you explain this situation? Yeah, because we are, together with the ministry, uh, we have worked out, uh, worked out and that circular has already been issued, updated circular. Uh, and we have categorized them to three, uh, four categories actually. Diagnosed pe uh, patients, diagnosed, within inside the hospital then second category is uh, highly suspicious but uh, still awaiting diagnosis and third category is sudden death I mean probable covid uh, victims where we have to diagnose and uh, fourth category is uh, other suspicious cases so what we decided uh, through the first issue is diagnosis of pathology because there's no issue regarding first two categories because uh, soaps and other things have taken, but still we, we, according to our general knowledge, we think there may be some percentage which, are, which could be negative in this uh, PCR test because of several reasons. It happened to us in uh, DNA testing also. Sometimes you could 
you don't find DNA after PCR. There, I mean, uh, what do you expect? So, uh, sec on the other hand, we cannot do complete uh, autopsies, but uh, our colleagues have already started in second category cases and before being moved out from the morgue, uh, they used to take uh, soaps as recommended by virologists and plus we used to take some lung biopsy also through one of the corners. So, with the time, we will have some material to say what is the exact pathology. Usually, we see interstitial pneumonia in those cases in the previous versions, but we don't know what is, what is really inside uh, in this case. It may be important to the physicians also when we collect the data. Second one, uh, there, we had, there had been argument what is the method of disposal. So, what uh, college recommended is uh, this uh, cremation is the method of choice because it burns the body into ashes to zero. Once body is burned into ashes, that means the forensic pathology is out. If it is a murder case, we can't say anything. So that nullifies any action, possible actions, anything from the virus because we do not know exactly, no one knows exact behavior of this virus, its long-term abilities ability to mutate, how it survive in the in a grave. It may be able to survive for a longer time in the graves. We don't know because it may take few years for us to have complete data. Like uh, when HIV came, we didn't know. Now we know. We put HIV case into the defreezer and it's battery is over. So it kills the HIV virus. So this one survives very well inside the defreeze. And uh, it kills, I mean, it's sensitive to high temperatures, as far as I know. But therefore, what we decide is we will seal the body inside the hospital and uh, within a body bag and hand over it to the undertaker. The, then uh, I think sanitization process will be done and undertaker will directly take it into the uh, crematorium because we have enough facilities to cremate the bodies. And I think it's the best way of doing it at this move. Later, we can change the guideline. Another thing what we suspect uh, is, uh, you can remember last April, that bomb blast, this is much more effective than a bomb blast. If we keep those bodies in burial, burial sites, the security of these sites are under question. You cannot keep them secure for longer years because uh, we don't know they are at various other people's custody and we will forget about it after some time. And terrorism, the possible biological terrorism. Someone can take a sample from this grave and use it to in, in infect the population. It will be much more disastrous than the bomb attack. So from that aspect also, college finally discussed and decided that uh, first three categories, the circle has, is there in, on the internet and being issued to all the physicians and other healthcare workers. The first three categories, we will recommend cremation. Third category, if it's negative, they can go for uh, normal funeral process and other things. Because our decision is not political, scientifically and medically legally based one. Of course, we know there is a protest from spiritual uh, leaders and various other part, but we, we have not considered those things at this point. So basically, your decision is based on the fact that uh, still we don't know much about this virus. So the best approach yeah. would be to take the stringent yeah. measure and without taking any chances at all, absolutely no chance at taking. And uh, contamination, when you go for burial, there are a lot of people involved in that. Washing, cleaning and all these things will stop with a sealed bag, which directly goes to the crematorium. Any, any other opinions from uh, other experts who are here? Manuj or Dr. BJC, anything? No, I think I think this was uh, this came up in the technical meeting uh, two days back in the afternoon, and I think there are general consensus. Uh, it was not only forensic forensic pathologists, but uh, across the board, it was very clear that when there are uncertainties, go for the best practice because you can't take chances, as uh, Dr. Wanpur very clearly mentioned. So when there are uncertainties, go for the best practice. And the best practice is clearly stated and written down. Uh, Dr. BJC, anything 
you want to mention actually the government edition is there so uh, yeah yes, yes. I, i hope very much it will not involve children hopefully but yes. as far as adults go i totally agree with dr vanpura that obviously for very many reasons which he so succinctly uh, told us uh, that i think the best would be cremation yeah so uh, yeah. yes 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 please uh, could i talk yeah yeah yes please you can hear you. yeah uh, i just would like to know from dr vanpura it's not not with regard to the system but with regard to the publicity that is being given by very this media uh, uh, stations uh, disregarding the uh, feelings of the loved ones i mean bringing some some sort of a disrepute to the uh, person who passed away and for the family uh, i mean is is that type of a behavior could be recommended or shouldn't it be sort of a in a more private form in a personal way that we should do it it is very very difficult to address those things because as forensic pathologists we do not take that uh, that part of course when you are doing <coughs> autopsies but uh, in this case what we <coughs> sorry uh, what we decided is to go for best practice and to ensure safety of the community not the individual we know that uh, as a, an individual he has a different they, they belong to different religious sects and they need their I mean uh, some rituals, but uh, we cannot take even minimal risk here because the you know the death rate and the outcome is very disastrous. And Un uh, until we know exact nature of this disease, that is the time. I mean uh, for the time being, with the time we may change the guidelines. It's the only guideline. But for the time being, I think we go for the safety. That's why they have locked up the villagers now. people are in a struggle they locked up the villagers curfew for many weeks in the same in the same pattern we thought that it should go for cremation uh, is it laid down that the pp has to be put into the uh, uh, the 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 fire the yeah, yeah, we, we is not laid down but i advise in my mortuary laborer when they bring that uh, in any suspicious body they have other barrel they put pp into that barrel and burn it so burning is as a forensic pen i know which makes bring I mean and drive everything into zero so that is the best practice thank you yeah and uh, there's another question coming from the participants uh, uh, text coming in that uh, it said it was initially shared as both practices are okay as a who guideline and later it was changed so uh, they are asking now uh, when will be the new guidelines be published and shared uh, now it's already uh, i think guidelines are already published yeah ministry circular uh, number ep 400/2019 slash so that is the it's a later circular dated first April 2020, so it's there. So it's I think must it's be available in the ministry website. So it's we have actually revised earlier guidelines allowed some burial, but we found it's not practical under present circumstances. Yeah, you know we cannot control other people who are involved in uh, this process, and it's very dangerous. Later we found uh, it's not practical, so therefore we decided to uh, stick to uh, cremation. at this point the surgery is available what is your yeah. opinion what is your opinion with regard to uh, for people with so much of faith in particular god they would prefer to hide all their illnesses and uh, might delay coming to hospital if we adhere to sort of uh, practices that would go against their religious beliefs so that would could be more Uh, disastrous uh, uh, as uh, far as the public health is concerned that's there because uh, not even covid but uh, we have cases time to time where they have gone to their I mean uh, religious missions to get I mean a pneumonia treated we had a child death few years back and we are getting regular cases from that point that has to be addressed by i think other health authorities with uh, together with uh, in uh, public health inspectors and others 
because we cannot address all these things when this is a disaster it's a national it's a global disaster when we want to prevent it you prevent it is a very hard decisions you know that is our way of thinking we you know i know you are a clinician you think of patient and various other aspects we do not because our target is to get the criminals to the guillotine so the, this is little harsh i am talking but in a very similar way we think that uh, should be finalized with the time we agree to discuss but uh now there are a few questions coming related to patient management i don't think uh, uh, today dr anand vijay vikram or dr amit is here they are having the college of physicians meeting uh, the questions are related to the use of chloroquine hydroxychloroquine and then uh, azathioprine and also related to this new drug uh, that's apparently been imported to sri lanka uh, any feedback from the clinicians here uh, Dr. BJC is here. Dr. Padma is here. Um, I don't see any others. If I may, I can make some observations. In fact, in our guidelines, we have mentioned at least some of them. Certainly not the latest one from Japan, because I don't think we have any information at all on that at the present time. Um, we have touched on some of these drugs, especially chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, uh, but generally. most of the opinions now say that it is not to be used on children at least at the present time um but i think what one must remember is that these are drugs we have been using for a very long time especially for malaria and uh, i mean in my experience in three of the stations out station where i work i mean i was in the thick of malaria epidemics and we did use these drugs even in infants so safety wise i don't think there should be any major concerns uh, and at the moment i think it is left to the treating uh, consultant pediatrician that uh, if the person thinks that it is necessary that you know it could be used in fact in our guidelines we have given the doses as well as given in uh, uh, just one or two uh, research papers and this one we adopted from cleveland and that's where the the we obtained the dose yeah. so that is the only one that uh, we have uh, uh, kind of uh, definitely uh, born into but the rest of the management in children really is nothing very uh, very different to what is going on normally and also that uh, we have actually dealt with uh, how to approach um, these uh, children who have more serious disease uh, i think you know it is it is also useful at this stage to to think about why is 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 this thing occurring relatively less numbers of children and also that the severity is also much less in these children Uh, there are now several hypotheses but nothing sort of absolutely true and i can just mention some of this uh, one is that the children in these during these epidemics and times of locked in and uh, curfews that they have less opportunities uh, to be exposed from the outside so because they are generally kept inside they are not taken out from home at all and the second one is the the children uh, almost by definition uh, from birth onwards they have a relatively mature immune system so that they they may be less prone uh, to produce adverse inflammatory responses as a result of that uh, so that is a second reason that is advocated these are all basically hypotheses um and the third one is that children uh, we know have less developed um, angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptors uh and their numbers are also small the receptors themselves are less mature and they are also functionally not as um effective as in adults so therefore when you have less of these to which these receptors are the ones to which the corona virus actually initially binds itself so that's one of the other reasons and the last one that they advocate 
is that uh, there is possibly there is some cross reactivity with other antibodies in children because they are more prone than adults to develop all kinds of viral infections and especially even other types of corona infections so that way i think you know we we uh, probably feel that uh, we are a little bit on the luckier side of it as far as pediatrics go but having said that you cannot totally exclude uh, children especially some very vulnerable children getting very very severe disease and the use of antibacterials we have dealt, dealt with uh, uh, very comprehensively in our guidelines and hopefully people will be able to read this uh, through our uh, college website very very soon and uh, then uh, there are some questions coming related to this uh, famous uh, the japanese drug apparently that has been important to import sri lanka like uh, Fafiba via or Avigan, the trade name. Uh, it was uh, in the news that it was important. There are some uh, questions coming in. Any clinicians, any physicians here in the forum? Yeah. Probably, I mean, since uh, there aren't uh, any, any physicians who are involved in this situation at the moment in this forum, what we can share is their opinion that was expressed. Uh, during the technical committee meetings, uh, but the but all the practice inclinations who are in the forefront there, but they felt is there is no enough evidence uh, related to the use of Avigant here. And uh, what they mentioned is even Japan or China, it is not in the official guidelines, and the evidence that has come is very inconclusive at the moment. So even though it was imported to Sri Lanka, uh, at the moment they. Uh, don't think that there's enough evidence to recommend it for treatment. Uh, uh, the, Indica, if I can yeah, add please, to that, please, yes, please. Yeah, please. Uh, uh, no, there no. is absolutely no um, tangible evidence yes, sir. Uh, yeah. with usefulness in children at the moment. And okay. because the numbers are small anyway uh, of uh, children who have been affected by the disease. So yeah. we really don't have anything. So as far as pediatrics go, we haven't. Uh, in fact, in our guidelines, we haven't even mentioned it. Yes, yeah. It was the same. I mean, among the general physicians also, the conclusion uh, seemed to be the same. Uh, Professor Arjuna Vihare, sir, I mean, as a senior clinician, would you like to say something here? Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think it's excellent the way that these guidelines have been developed. I know the College of Surgeons Jaindra and everybody has suggested what should be done about elective and non-elective operations and where they should be done and so on. And I'm not going to attempt to repeat what they got, but I, I hope the ministry, I know they sent it all to the ministry. Um, I think the, the, the guidelines on diagnosis and treatment uh, are clear. And I, what I was trying to think is whether there's any way a summary of these guidelines can be emailed round to those who are on your email address or the surgeon's email address or the physician's email address so that everyone can get a document which embodies the guidelines. Now, for example, I don't know what some of them are. And uh, I'm not suggesting you tell me now. What I'm suggesting is that some thing be prepared and email round to everybody so that uh, what is known and what guidelines are available are known to uh, all the doctors who are emailable and in due course maybe to, even to the public given the absence of newspapers and god knows what else yeah thank you sir and uh, finally i think we are moving into the last part of this discussion uh, now again a uh, rather contentious question coming up uh, from the participants regarding wearing of masks. Uh, at the moment, I don't think we have anyone from the Ministry of Health in the list here. Pamod, do we have anyone, Dr. Deepa or anyone here? Does it look like, sir, at the moment? Okay, yeah. 
so still still the i think the ministry very recently also they have released a circular uh, which clearly mentions that uh, that it's recommended for the uh, the health workers who are attending the suspect patients or patients who are are in having having respiratory symptoms or when they have been transformed to the uh, hospital that the mask has to be worn uh, so as far as i understand there is nothing saying from the ministry of say, uh, health that no one should be not wearing there is it, the guideline doesn't say not to wear what it says is uh, it is not recommended for the general public at this situation so this is uh, this is the current uh, the ministry of health stance and who stands also as it is is the same any any feedback related to the current situation can i yes yeah yeah issue is uh, yeah i know that this is a hot topic and there are criticisms and around the issue is do we have a community spread at the moment the clear answer is still we do not have any evidence therefore the issue is is there a use for people or the general public why that is the stands i think uh, the epidemiology also stands that is why there is no compulsory recommendation coming for people to wear that is first one second one even if people wants to wear it and they more wear it the problem is to what extent people are aware how to wear a mask if they don't wear a mask in the proper manner they are in a more danger than not wearing a mask you just have to look how people wear mask even some of our health workers they are putting the mask they are touching the mask they are removing it and putting it again they are touching it so many times so you are really unnecessarily exposing yourself to possible exposure if anything is on any surface or whatever because things are mainly getting into you through your hands so if you look at what's happening around people are using mask different sort of mask how what protection they have is a questionable second is do they really know how to wear is how to remove it and how to dispose it so all these questions is there so looking at all these when there is no evidence of clear community spread up to now and advocating mask would pose them in much danger than not wearing a mask i think this is the basis of uh, talking about mask and not recommending mask yeah. so so uh, currently indica, after this indica, yes can i yeah. mention yes, something please. that is a little yes. bit related to this yes yeah um now now this is about the general population wearing mask so that has already been addressed but what i am more concerned are the personal protective equipment that the health workers have to wear do our people really know how to put on this equipment how to and to take them off now there are some excellent videos uh, yes. that i available i think i have sent one to uh, indica as well which actually shows how to actually put on this equipment and more importantly how to take it off now if you don't do it properly these uh, very same health workers are actually exposing themselves to the possibility of contracting the disease so i think it's very important for them uh, to to realize how to actually don the garments and the equipment and also doff the garments and equipment as they call it. um i i don't know whether we can really put some of these uh, videos on to the slma website where they, it will be um, available uh, very freely for people to have a look at it I'm, yeah. i'm telling you that some of these videos are extremely good and personally i learned quite a few things from that as well yeah uh, so i mean uh, i i fully agree with you i mean regardless of whatever recommendation or guideline anyway if you go out you can see people are wearing mask and uh, 
many are wearing mask in the wrong way and some are many are not wearing the correct mask also which doesn't give any kind of protection to them so in that case i think uh, it would be very appropriate that if we focus on the education part how and when how to wear it correctly and what to wear so because uh, probably education looks like an area that has uh, not got enough attention here so this could be one area that we can really focus on if you are wearing a mask what kind of mask has to be worn and what's the correct way and like manoj very correctly mentioned if you don't do it correctly you are putting yourself more at risk than not to wear it so i think this should be an area and again we have seen many uh, kind of information no messages going around trying to correlate correlate the use of mask in japan and their level of control in this is but something that we need to remember is that japan and those five eastern countries they have been wearing mask for decades and they know exactly how to do it and the technique because they have been experiencing the epidemic since the beginning of year 2000 so in that case they know exactly what to do it but in our country that knowledge seem to be lacking so we are in fully agreement that we need to focus a lot on education how to wear uh, there is one other thing about these masks in the community i don't know whether many people have looked at it that way um there may be a little bit of stigma attached to this as well you know general public some of them at least know that you know it is not absolutely necessary unless you have some kind of um, respiratory problem or something of that nature to wear a mask so that they tend to look rather suspiciously on people who are actually wearing masks so that part also i think needs to be as you correctly yeah, say i think yeah. people need to be educated on this yes yeah i think dr shiran chandra sri want to Uh, because she is the expert on this area, Dr. Shirani. Dr. Shirani, can you hear us? Any comments from others related to this? Ah, uh, Indika, I just want to make a comment. Yes. This is with regard to mask. The now for you and me that who we think that we are the medical professionals, do we have a place to buy masks? I mean, we are talking on masks, but there is surgical masks are not available for people. So if in a setting like that, uh, I I just do not know. I mean, uh, for us, uh, what we could talk on because it's not available for us to purchase anywhere. It's not available in pharmacies. it's not available in nursing home pharmacies or anywhere so the the now these masks that we see are disposable masks yes. and as you we are it once that you have to dispose yes. them yes. but yeah. then for our setting i mean even for you and me that uh, uh, there is no way that we could dispose them because it's not available freely so i just do not know uh why and why why we are talking when it's not available for people yeah yeah that's a, that, that, that there is a point in that as well i think it is not a problem in sri lanka i mean it's a worldwide problem there was a news coming yesterday that usa has basically literally hijacked a plane and then got the the uh, consignment of masks to their country something like that which was actually going on media worldwide there's a huge shortage and and who will also I agree with that aspect. I mean, if you take the Sri Lankan situation, we have over 140,000 health workers, and on a given day, about 40,000 40,000 are working. So, if we insist that we are giving, we have to give mask for all the health professionals, which is a must actually. Then we are talking about 40,000 simple mask. Let leave alone the PPE. 40,000 mask for the health professionals on a daily basis. And if we recommend it for the whole Sri Lankan population. we are talking about again at least maybe 5 million or even more than that so i mean uh, is there any country which can do that i don't know i mean it's a real practical issue so that issue also comes in because we have seen that lot of people are blaming that the the ministry is recommending not to wear because of this inability it's not actually inability it's a reality at the same time i think the reasons that ministry is not recommending 
he saw rational reasons related to the protect, protection it gives. Having said that, this, this availability is also a definite issue. Yeah. Dr. Wanpura? Yes. Yeah. Uh, you want to make a comment? Uh, as a, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, yes, no, so I think uh, this seminar is very webinar is very important for the our practitioners to uh, get into the I mean, uh, current situation. As a for forensic pathology, actually our main one of the main concern concerns which we could not address at this moment is the exact pathological process. What is exactly going inside the lung? We do not know when we will be able to address it. But uh, with the time, we may be able to collect the material because of this. We do not know much about the virus and we don't have facilities to do complete autopsies in this type of case. Nowhere in the world, it's, they do not have. So we cannot, but with the time, we will be able to tell the physicians what we can, uh, what is actually going inside the lungs and other organs in this case. Yeah, I think there's... A lot of knowledge that needs to come. I think there's uh, yeah. some evidence come. Yeah, yes, anyone? Yeah. Uh, is anyone from uh, any pathologist or infectious disease expert who can answer this question? Dr. B. Jesse, would you like to comment on this? Um, not particularly anything very um, yeah. significant that I can add to the uh, what is going on. Obviously, we need information. We also need clinical information about the types of cases that we have. We are only hearing about the patients who have died. We are hearing about those patients who have got poor morbidities and things like that. I think the medical profession needs uh, more details of what they say these positives now we, we have a hundred odd positives uh, are they really very ill or what kind of category do they mm. fall into i think somebody should have this kind of data in a database because when it comes to finally analyzing what has gone on in the country maybe months later this information becomes very important so um, really that information has to be collated but if I may be allowed to just mention one other thing, I think people may be really worried about this. This is not related to the, 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 the current uh, component of this topic that you are discussing. The other one is probably very important one that people should know about is vertical transmission. Uh, because when you have infectious diseases affecting um, pregnant mothers, you have to really think always of the possibility of transmission to the unborn baby. And up to the present time, uh, looking at all the information that is available and looking at it very critically, although there is only a scarcity of data, that there is no information to suggest that there is any significant transmission from the affected mother to her unborn baby. Um, there are certain issues that we need to address after birth. Uh, and one, of course, is feeding. We have three options which we have discussed uh, quite significantly in our guidelines. One is, should it be normal feeding with the mother taking all precautions and normal breastfeeding of the baby? Or separation of the mother and baby and to give the baby express breast milk? Or third, whether to give formula feeds to the baby. So. In these kind of situations, I think we have to take into account a lot of other effects, a lot of other opinions, and certainly the opinions of the mother as well, and then make a very informed, uh, well-informed decision regarding what uh, kind of direction in which we need to progress. Uh, the decision should be an informed and considered decision uh, based on all these factors by the um, pediatrician who's called upon to look after this baby. 
Yeah. Uh, so I think, uh, so you, you highlight the, the need for more data and more research. In that case, actually, from a CLMS point of view, we, we encourage that decision making. When it comes to the management of COVID-19, we have to go for the best evidence that is available. So uh, from a CLMA, uh, we have started the, the ethical approval process, ethical review process, which is ex accelerated. So ethical approval will be given within one week's duration uh, to the approved project. So uh, from SLMA, we invite all the medical researchers to come together because we need Sri Lankan data. And at the moment, we don't have many publications. I don't think we have any publication at the moment. So I think it's time for us to get together and then uh, come out with uh, and develop an evidence base. So SLMA request from all the medical researchers to come together and uh, then come out with your research proposals because we have the process, uh, the accelerated process that uh, we take only one week's duration. So this is an invitation from SLMA. And with that, we will conclude this very important and very informative webinar where we have highlighted the need for a high degree of suspicion, the need to increase the testing capacity and need to protect our elderly and to adhere the safest precautions when there are not enough guidance and the importance of education and the importance of data and research. And I thank all the resource persons for their excellent contribution and clarifying many areas. And there are some areas uh, that are not clarified and we'll be working on that and the discussion is going on and we'll be sharing this very valuable information in our platforms and in conclusion again i thank all of you and let's meet in another one week's time thank you thank you slma and thank you indica for thank this you. Very good effort